Well, hey, praise the Lord. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Sunday Sermon Series. Once again, coming through with a word for your heart and for your soul. We pray that all is well with you on this Lord's Day morning. Amen. We should be right now live over Facebook and YouTube and Spreaker.com. We pray uh, that you'll be able to stay with us as we once again open up the Word of God. Amen. You can also go to our website, which is that's the word.org. Leave us your contact information, and we will send you a copy of our uh, newsletter, uh, letting you know what's going on in the ministry. Amen. You can also go to our YouTube channel, which is That's the Word Ministries. Amen. And you can subscribe if you so desire. Amen. So we just bless the Lord and honor him and thank him for what he is doing. We're excited this morning. We're beginning a brand new series, a brand new series entitled Like Wheat. Like Wheat. And in this particular series, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some powerful truths that we need to remember uh, when we are being sifted. And if you are a Christian, uh, you will be sifted if you have not been already. Sifting is a is a process, and we're going to get into it, obviously. But sifting is a process uh, that will go on in your life throughout uh, your Christian life intermittently. There are times in our lives where we will be sifted. And today, today we're going to talk about uh, some of those reasons why. Amen. So stay with us. We pray that you will uh, be informed, be enlightened, uh, be empowered, and be encouraged on this morning as we open up the Word of God. When we come back, we're going to pray, and we're going to jump right into this Word for today. Amen. So, in that, in that time, uh, stay with us, and we will be right back. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We are back. Just want to remind you, if you are watching right now uh, over Facebook, uh, you can uh, share this page if you so desire. Uh, that also, uh, others also may be blessed. We always want to ensure uh, that as many people as possible are able to hear uh, this life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You become a part, a part of the ministry of reconciliation uh, when you share out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we want to again, thank you for doing so. Amen. We're going to pray. Amen. Lord, we bless your name this morning. We thank you once again uh, for giving us this time and this opportunity to open up your word. Lord, we pray for the next few minutes, Lord, that you might be the silent listener to all that we do and say here. Uh, Lord, we need you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we don't look to ourselves. Uh, Lord, we look to you for all that we have. Lord, if it were not for you, Lord, we would not be here. So, Lord, I pray that you will open up our hearts and open up the hearts of those who will be under the sound of your word today. Uh, Lord, we pray for your anointing. Lord, we pray for clarity of mind and heart, even as your word goes forth. Lord, have your way. Draw those who need to hear this word to this place on the World Wide Web. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen. God is good. God is good. God bless you, Debbie. God bless you, Sherry. Amen. Good morning, good morning, and good morning. Amen. Well, let's open up the Bible and let's go to the book of Luke, the book of Luke, Luke chapter number 22, Luke chapter number 22, Luke 22, and we're going to read a little more extensively than we usually read. Usually we read uh, a few verses, one to two, maybe three verses. Today we are going to read about 10 verses, uh, but they are all uh part of what we will be talking about uh, these next several weeks. Amen. So let's start here in Luke chapter 22, and let's start in verse number 23. Amen. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But you shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you 
let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that does serve. For whether is greater, he that sits at meat or he that serves, is not he that sits at meat, is it not he that sits at meat? But I am among you as he that serves. You are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Verse number 30, verse number 29. And I appoint to you a kingdom as my father has appointed to me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. Now this morning, uh, for a few minutes, I'd like to talk to you about the process. The process. And that process that we're talking about uh, this morning and for the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about the process that is called sifting. Sifting. What is sifting? What does it mean to be sifted? As we said uh, in our opening, uh, if you are a Christian, uh, you will be sifted. You or you may have been sifted or you may be in the midst of being sifted even as we speak. Sifting uh, is a process uh, that goes on in the life of every Christian, but there is a need and there is a purpose for sifting. Amen. So we want to just break down and unpack, uh, unpack this uh, divine, uh, d- divine dynamic here this morning. Amen. Because once again, the more we know about what sifting is, it's going to help us uh, to be patient. Uh, and to be determined uh, because sifting, the sifting process will either crush you or it will build you for life. That's what the, the sifting process is all about. It is either going to crush you or build you for life. Now, there are two sides to sifting. And we're going to, uh, let me, we're gonna, once again, we're going to talk more about the dynamics of it. But there are two sides of sifting. This whole process of sifting may come directly from the hand of God. Directly from the hand of God. We'll see why he would do such a thing. Amen. Secondly, sifting may come from Satan as allowed by God, as he gives Satan permission And so those are the two sides. And it does not, it will not benefit us at all to try and figure out what is the source of this sifting. Is this God doing this or allowing this? Is this Satan trying to break me down? What we know in all cases of sifting, Satan is trying to accomplish something in your life. What we do know from sifting is that God is trying to accomplish something in our life. And so both Satan and the Lord himself have two different objectives when it comes to sifting. Amen? Satan wants to break us down. God seeks to lift us up, build us up through these things. Amen? Now, the sifting process, uh, the sifting process uh, is littered with pain, Suffering, adversaries, trials, challenges. I know all these things sound terrible, and and they, they and they are, and they can be. Uh, but that's the the sifting process is littered with things like that. But at the same time, at the same time, it's littered with other things. Amen. Three things about the sifting process. Number one. It is, the sifting process is a divine process. It is divine. 
whether it's coming directly from God or whether God is allowing Satan to have some uh, to have some leeway uh, in our lives and in our, in our situations. It is a divine process. It's a divine process because it's overseen by him. It is overseen by him. He will not allow. Remember, he will not allow us. We get this from 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 13. God will not allow us to be tempted above that ye are able. That is the word. That is the truth. He will not allow you or I to be tempted or tried above that which we are able to withstand. I know it feels that way. When we're going through the the, the, the proverbial ringer, it feels as if it's too much. How many times have you or I uttered those words, I can't take it. This is too much. What's going on? That's what we do. That's what we say. But God God has a barometer. God has a divine barometer. And each individual has a, a barometer. The, the amount of, of, of things and stuff that an individual can take. And only God knows that. You may not be able to take or endure what I have endured. You may not be able to. I may, my, I may not be able to endure the things that you have endured in your life. God knows each one of us. And each one of our trials and tests are 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 made, if I can use that phrase, made. They are just for us. He knows what we can bear. I know Satan seems like he is the uh, that he is the one who is in charge, but he is not. He is not. God is in charge uh, at all times. So the sifting process is a divine process. Amen. It is God who seeks to build us up. And there are times when he uses the enemy to build us up. You need look no further than to the book of Job. And you see this conversation that happens in the heavenlies between God and Satan, literally in Job chapter number one. And we see that here is Job not knowing and not understanding what's going on in the heavenly realms. I don't know if your name or my name has ever been brought up in the heavenly places, but I do know that Satan seeks to bring us down. And God will give him, as we said, that leeway. He will give him that rope from time to time to show Satan, watch what happens. Watch what happens. Amen. And so we must not allow uh, the sifting process to crush us. Don't allow that sifting process to crush us, amen? Because in, as we said, that the sifting process is going to be littered, littered with adversaries and trials and challenges and all of these things, we also know that the sifting process is going to include mercy. It's going to include grace. It's going to include peace. It is going to produce patience. All of these things are part of the sifting process. You see, because there are some things about us that need to be changed. There are some things about all of us that need to be changed. And sometimes it's the sifting process that God uses to rid us of those things in our life that we don't need. Amen. That's what that's for. So, Number one, the sifting process is a divine process. Now, along with that, the sifting process, number two, the sifting process is a necessary process. It is necessary. As we said, we have things in our lives that need changing. You need to go no further here than to look in this book that we just finished reading, the book of Luke, and we read, we read how the disciples Men walking with the Lord for nearly three years. They were jockeying for position. It had been three years at this point in time, actually. But here they were jockeying for position to see which one of them was going to be the greatest. You see, you see, they needed to be chopped down. They, they, they had pride. And th 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 we may not have pride. But there are different things in our lives that we need to say, listen, Lord, I give this to you. Lord, help me with this. 
Lord, this is something that I that I don't need. The sifting process is necessary to rid us of the of the dirt. Now, the sifting process, let me give you number three, and this is going to cap this part off. The sifting process is a violent process. The sifting process. Notice what he says, what the Lord tells of Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired or, or demanded. Now, he can make a demand, but God does not have to bow down to any demand of, of Satan, of course. But that's what the word means. Satan has demanded to have you, to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, let me give you some insight on this verse here. That word, he was, Jesus was addressing Peter. He was addressing Peter. But the word you in that verse is plural. It is plural. So what Jesus is saying, he's looking at Peter and he's saying, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you all like wheat. Like we, all of us, all of us are part of Satan's program to bring us down. Now, the sifting process was needed to take wheat and separate it from the chaff, to separate it from that which was not real, okay? And it was a process that required shaking, and there was a shaking that would take place, and it would separate the real from the unreal, and so the sifting process, spiritually speaking, is a violent process. There's going to be some, some shaking. Uh, there's going to be some tumult. Uh, there's going to be some trials and, and some, some testing. But it's all, once again, it's all for a divine purpose. It's necessary. It's divine. And it is, and it is a violent process. It's going to move you. It's going to cause some things to leave your life. But at the same time, it's going to bring, it's going to introduce other things into your life that are necessary. Notice what he says in verse number 32. He says, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. I have prayed for you. Now, the process. Let's talk about this process. Let's talk about the reason for this process called sifting. You might say, why does God want us to go through? Why does God allow us to go through such things? Why? Is, is, isn't there another way? Couldn't God do something else? I, I, I would imagine God is God. And he can make us into, into uh, the proverbial robot that would do whatever he wants and say whatever he wants. And, and there would be no you know, nothing adverse about our Christian lives at all. Just We would just fall in line and all do the same thing, the same way, the right way. But that's not how it is. That's not how God has planned it all out in that sense of the word. That's not what God has done. There is a process. There is a process. And this process, God bless you, Francis. Uh, this process, this sifting process is going to shake some things loose in your life. Number one, the sifting process is a refining process. It is a refining process. It prunes us. Number one, it frees us. It frees us from what in our life is vulgar, from what in our life is coarse. It, it, it frees us up. That's one of the things that the, the, the uh, uh, sifting process does. Secondly, the sifting process uh, removes imperfections in our life. And it, and it is a way that God uses to mature us, to bring us into maturity and bring us into alignment with his word and with his will. Once again, the, the, the sifting process is that divine process. It's going to accomplish all of these things. And it's not always going to be a, a, a good time when we are enduring these things, if I can use that phrase, a good time. Thirdly, when we're talking about the fact that the sifting process refines us, it is it eventually what it's going to do, uh, it is going to elevate us through subtraction. 
it is going to elevate us through subtraction. In other words, it's going to pull things out. It's going to take things away from us. You see, we have a tendency to hold on to those things in our life and hold on to those things in our heart and our life that, that we desire, that, that we want. And many of these things are not beneficial. Many of these things are of a carnal nature and we, we want to, we hold on. We, we don't want to let some things go. But the sifting process, once again, is meant to shake it loose, shake it loose. And sometimes, sometimes yet, we still hold on for dear life. No, I can't let that go. No, I can't let that go. God is trying to say, you need me, not it, not that. You need more of me. So the fact is that great faith must be tested greatly. Great faith must be tested greatly. Now, we're not talking about the amount of faith. When I talk about great faith, I'm not talking about the amount, how much faith you have. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that where your faith lies, where is your faith? Is your faith in yourself? Is your faith in your works? Is your faith in someone or something? Your faith, the object of your faith, rather, needs to be in Christ Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. That's where our faith belongs. Amen? That's where our faith belongs. And when our faith is in Christ, that's what we're talking about, great faith. When your faith is in Christ, that's great faith. That's great faith. So great faith must be tested greatly. It was it was the Apostle Paul who told uh, young Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 12, he told him, fight the good fight of faith faith. What did he mean by that? Fight the good fight of faith. Paul had been fighting that fight for his entire ministry. The fight of faith. Listen, it is your faith. It is your faith that Satan wants to waylay. It is your faith that Satan wants to destroy. If he can get you to, to, to abandon your faith, he will have accomplished much if he could do it. But the simple truth is you are here. You are still here because he cannot remove you arbitrarily. He cannot remove you because he wants to. You are still in God's hand. All Satan's strategies, all of Satan's strategies hinge on this number one fact that he wants to destroy your faith. Amen. He wants to shake it loose, shake it loose through devastation frustration. He wants to shake it loose. Uh, he wants to deceive you. He wants to deceive you. Uh, he wants to bring discouragement. He wants to bring discord. Oh yes, discord. One between another. One brother between another brother or sister, however it goes, you're at each other. And that kind of, kind of thing can cause separation and division. That's what Satan desires. And that's, once again, that is, that is going to be a hit to your faith. Because you, say, you can't serve God properly when you're at odds with your brother or sister in Christ. He's going to attack your faith. And as we said last time, we got together that all of these things that Satan wishes to accomplish in our lives, his strategy is distraction. Distraction is the thief of everything. Distractions. Have you ever, have you ever uh, tried to talk to someone, and I have many times, have you ever tried to talk to someone uh, who is watching something on television? I'm, I'm going to use television. They're watching something on television, and you're trying to talk to them, and you're over here, and the TV is right there, and they hear you, but they are focused on that TV, and they cannot bring their eyes away. They're like, they're like transfixed. They say, yeah, yeah, and they're still looking that their head is still trying to be there, but they hear your voice and they're trying to... Listen, you can't do both at the same time. You can't do both at the same time. We have our eyes elsewhere and the Lord is calling us. The Lord is calling us here and we're saying, yes, yes, I hear you. Yeah, Lord, I hear you. I hear your our eyes. Though our head and our bodies may be turning, our eyes are still in the wrong place. Our eyes 
our ears, our focus. He needs to be the object of our faith. Satan wishes to rip that from us. Third thing, why sifting? Because sifting ratifies. We said that sifting refines us and prunes us. We said that sifting, uh, that it, it proves us. It proves us. I didn't say that early. It proves us. In other words, uh, the, the sifting process, it tests the genuineness of your faith. The genuineness of your faith. We said that great faith must be tested greatly. Thirdly, it ratifies. That means it confirms and establishes your calling. This Christian life. Now, it, 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 set, it, it confirms your calling in two ways. Once again, your calling that the Lord calls you into once you are saved. That's your calling or your purpose, as we may put it. But also, this entire Christian life as a whole, it is a calling. This is a calling. He has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is a calling. And so the Christian life, uh, the, the, the sifting that takes place, it ratifies and establishes us in our calling. That's what uh, it does. That's exactly what it does. When you go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter number 8, Deuteronomy chapter number 8, and verse number 2, Deuteronomy chapter number 8, and verse number 2, we read something very uh, very interesting here. It says, and you shall remember, this is God talking to the children of Israel, and you shall remember, it's, this is Moses recounting, this is Moses actually speaking, and you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness, led you 40 years in the wilderness. You were in the wilderness, but you were being led by God. God put you here. He's the one leading you. So you're not alone. You're in the wilderness, but you're not alone. He says how he led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. Once again, there's a purpose for what God does. He says to humble you and to prove you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. You see, there is always a motive. It, nothing is done without a purpose or a reason. Things don't just happen arbitrarily because they just happen. God has a purpose. Now, here you see verse number two. He is telling them, you were in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, we know the reason how they were catapulted into the wilderness because of their unbelief. We know that from earlier where... Uh, the whole generation had to die out before they were allowed to come out of that wilderness. We understand the root problem was unbelief. But now, once they're there, he says, "I now you're here, I'm going to humble you, and I'm going to prove you. I'm going to test you. I'm going to test you to see whether you are going to serve me or not. And obviously, the remnant obviously did. Where does your faith lie? Where does your faith lie? You and I, you and I will be sifted. You and I will be sifted. I'm thinking back, I'm thinking back uh, to 2000 and uh, 2000 and 2000 actually and the September 11th attacks. My son told me, my son told me he said, there's going to be a war. He had just come out of basic training. He said, there's going to be a war. And I said, I don't, I don't know. He gets called away. Uh, he had, once again, he had just enlisted six months prior. And he enlists and he goes in and he goes to Japan. He goes to Japan. I get a letter a few, a few weeks later that they're shipping him out. We don't know where, we don't know exactly. I'm not allowed to tell you. I don't know whether he knew, but he said, we can't, I can't tell you where we're going. Where they were going was to the the Gulf. They were going into Afghanistan, and and they were going to this convergence, this war that was that was had taken started to take place, and that's where they were going. 
And that's where he lost his life. That's where he lost his life. Now, that was, that whole entire time was a time of, 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 of sifting. Sifting. Now, Satan has no pity, he has no mercy. Satan doesn't care about all that stuff. Satan looks at this situation. He sees what goes on. And I'm sure that Satan, and when I'm talking about Satan, I'm talking about all the forces of darkness and evil, that they're standing back watching to see what's going to happen. What is this person going to do? They, they have to bow down and say, God is unfair. They have to go down on their knees and put their fists up to God and say, God, I hate you. That's what, that's what the forces of darkness want to pull out of you. That's what they want. But what does God say? God, on the other hand, uses this time to build you. Oh, it was a dark time. It was a dark time. Ten months later, ten months later, ten months later, my daughter, she passes away. In my arms, right in my arms. She swooned right in my arms. If you've seen, if you've seen movies and television when somebody passes away when, in somebody's arms and you just see them just go up. Right in my arms. What what do you do? What do you do? You continue to trust God. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Difficult times. And oh yes, yes, yes. Sifting. Sifting. Those were times when my faith was tested. My faith was tested. Our faith, family's faith, my wife's faith, we were being tested. God, see, God allowed it. God allowed it. And to this day, you want to tell, you want to ask me why? I'm going to tell you, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I have to leave all of those details in his hands. And yes, I remember saying at that time, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him why. You know what's going to happen when you and I get to heaven? You want to know what's going to happen? When you get to heaven, when I get to heaven, we are not going to have not one question. Why? Why will we not have one question? Because everything will be clear. The Bible says that we shall be changed. We shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And at that moment, at that very moment, when we are changed, all questions will have been answered. Everything will be clear. And we will know that God is righteous in all of his judgments. We are not going to get to heaven and say, Lord, why did you do this? And, and why? No. No. When we get to heaven, everything will be perfect. Everything will be absolutely perfect. Amen? And sometimes, and sometimes, yes, Debbie, uh, sometimes it takes a while to, to come back from devastation. It takes a while. I had some dark days. I had some dark days and some dark nights. But at the same time, I understood. I understood that God was there. God was there. So we said that the sifting process is going to be filled with some pain and some suffering. It's going to be some dark times in your time of sifting. Amen. It, it may be of a physical nature. It may be of a mental nature. It may be of a spiritual nature. Okay, it may be of an emotional nature, but the sifting process is always going to bring you to a place when, when we receive the sifting process properly, it is go always going to lead us to a place where we are built up in Christ. And no, we may not yet be released from the sifting process with answers. All we know that we will be better for it. Yes, we will be better for it. Amen. And as we move along in this series, we're we're we're, we're going to uh, we're going to talk about uh, the God's plan. We're going to talk about some of the pain, and we're going to talk about uh, God's provision and and God's promise in in this thing called the sifting process. But once again, this this entire uh, process is always meant to build you up, to build you up. To this day, I can remember people coming to me and, and asking me, 
I don't know how you do it at my job. I don't know how you do it. Oh, I don't know how you do it, Michael. I don't know how you can, you know, you lost your son, you lost your, I don't know how you do it. Listen, your life, you see, what happens is your life, when people see and know what you're dealing with, at least from the outside, externally, they know what has happened in your life. They don't know what's going on on the inside, but they see how you are receiving it, at least externally, that the way that you receive your sifting process will be a testimony to other people. A testimony. You see, and even such a time as that, people can be drawn to the Lord. I had an opportunity to say, well, it's all God. And I know the people at my job are wondering, what does that mean? What are you talking about? What do you mean? You know, all they know is that, you know, you have a lot of strength and you have a lot of fortitude. Wow, you know, that's from the world perspective. They don't know the Lord. So, but I know that whatever, whatever strength anyone sees, it's not me. It's not me. It's God. Remember, we said that the sifting process is going to produce his mercy and his grace and his peace and his patience. All of these things are part of what was beginning to be uh, created in me as the sifting process was being taken place. Alongside, alongside of, of the, the hard times that the enemy was still trying to, trying to beat you down. I, I sat in my den on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, after I had lost my son and my daughter. And that first Christmas, after they both were gone. And I sat in my den, just sitting there in the dark. In the middle of the day. Closed the curtains and just sat in my den, in my office, in the dark. For at least several hours. Just sat there. Not thinking about doing anything, but just sitting there, just just lamenting, just sad. My wife walks in. It's simple, simple words. Simple words, the, the, the same words, the very same words uh, that God told Elijah when he was in the cave. She walked into that den and she stood there, the lights out, the shades are down, and the curtains, are, and she walked in and turned on the light and simply said, what are you doing? And those simple words, those simple words, it shook me enough. It shook me enough that I said, what am I doing? And I shook myself <laughs> in in not a, 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 not a real sense, but I, I got myself together. I came to myself and I, Satan got me to that place. He got me there where things, if, if I would have stayed in that state, he got me to a place where I was depressed, I was discouraged, and he would have brought oppression, and he would have, and who knows, who knows what the enemy would have tried to bring out in my life. But what are you doing? What are you doing in your time of sifting? Are you lamenting? Are you trying to figure it all out? Listen, the place where you are, I read this somewhere years ago, and it's so true. It, it, think about it. It, it. it doesn't sound like it's true, but it's true. No matter, in, no matter what situation you're in. The place where you are is the place where God needs for you to be. At that particular time, the place where you are. Now, it may not be the place appointed. It may not be the place that he, want, that, that he has put you, but where you are, that's where he wants you to be. The children of Israel were, the children of Israel were, were, were in the middle of the ocean and the enemy was coming that's not fair the egyptians were coming to bring them back and they were caught in between an ocean and here comes the enemy uh we have we we've done it's over it's over we are gonna die right now but what did god do he opened up he opened up the sea for them to go through the place where you are is the place where he's allowed you to be. Let's put it that way. It's the place where he's allowed you to be. He's allowed you to be there. Now, the extenuating circumstance as to how you got there, whether you did something to make yourself be there, whether somebody else had something to do with you being there, or whether God has, has placed you there, or whether the enemy has put you there by God's permission, I don't know. I don't know. 
But when we allow the Lord to work in us and through us, we will see God's mighty hand, even in our time of sifting. If you've ever watched a James Bond movie, and I have, I'm I'm the old, I'm the old movie file, the old classic movie file. That's that's me. That's 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 me. And something that the James Bond character always says in most of his movies, at least, when he's sitting at a bar, and he always has a vodka martini, which I don't know what it is. I've never had it. I've never drank. I don't know what it is, but a vodka martini. And he always says he wants it shaken, but not stirred. Shaken, but not stirred. Now, I don't know what that means in the natural sense. I don't know what that means. But spiritually speaking, the sifting process is going to shake you. It's going to be violent. It's going to be something that's going to happen. There's going to be some things that are going to be moved out of place, necessarily. They're going to be moved out of place. But you don't have to be stirred. You don't have to be stirred. You don't, you don't have to come to a point where you're so decimated by what is happening that it takes you out. Yes, you will be shaken, but don't be stirred. Don't be stirred because God knows what he is doing. God knows what he is doing, amen, in our lives and in our uh, situations. These men, these men that we read about here uh, in the book of uh, Peter, once again, jockeying, jockeying for position. There was some pride. There was some pride that they needed to be cut down a piece. They needed to be cut down. And Peter, Peter would come face to face with his reckoning in just a, probably just a few hours, he would come face to face with his own words. I'll go, I'll, I'll die with you. No, he was not willing. He didn't know himself. And that's another reason why sometimes God allows us to be sifted because we really don't know ourselves. We think we know ourselves. Listen, if you've ever said, I'm talking about the pride factor here, but if you've ever said, oh, Oh, I could never do that. Or if you've ever said, what's wrong with these people? How could they do uh, such a thing? Or if you've ever said, don't they know any better? If you've ever said anything like that, you are in line for a sifting. Because there's some pride that's in your life. You think that you will never do what you saw somebody else do. You're wondering whether they know better uh, or not. You're wondering. Don't allow pride to be the thing that leads you into sifting. Now there are many other there are many other things going on in our lives, many other things internally. We have things in us. We have we have those so-called acceptable sins. You know what an acceptable sin was? God bless you, uh, Robillard. Uh, you know what an acceptable sin is? An acceptable sin is those sins in our life that we accept. Things that we say, that's just how I am. Or that's just me. We, 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 we use that. We use that to cover. That's a cover of justification. It, it's okay because that's just, that's just my makeup. That's just how I was built. That's just how I am. But if just how you are clashes with what scripture says, then how you are is not the right way. Okay? So we need to make sure, make sure that we don't, don't allow the flesh to enter in to this thing uh, called, once again, don't let that be the thing that leads you into being sifted. Now, other times, what, what do we say? The sifting process may have nothing to do outright with anything you have done. Job didn't do anything wrong to be catapulted into the situation that he was in. He did nothing amiss. But when he came out, when Job came out of his sifting process, which the Bible doesn't call it a sifting process, but obviously it was. When Job came out of that sifting process, 
let me go to Job's words because I don't want to miss. I don't want to misread them. Job in Job chapter uh, forty-two and verse number five, he says, "I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you." That was the culmination of his sifting process. That was it. That was what God was trying to bring out of him in his sifting process. That was the purpose of it all. I have heard of you. We read about all the things that Job did at the beginning. He did all the right things. He prayed for his family. He, he, he sacrificed for his family. He did all these things for his family. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. I know this is what I was supposed to do, so I'm going to do it. He said, but now my eyes see you he had a different he, he had an entirely different view of things after he had gone through this sifting process he says now i see you you have been revealed to me i know you in a greater and deeper way now and he says in verse number six wherefore i abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes you see he's brought to a place of repentance through the sifting process. You see, pride is gone. No more faith in his works. All the things that he did, that's all over. I repent in dust and ashes. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you as we close that you and I, you and I need, we need sometimes, many times, we need to be sifted. It brings about repentance. It brings about change. It brings about revival. It brings about revelation. We need the sifting process. Not pleasant while we're in it. Not pleasant while we are in it, undergoing it. No, no. But we need that sifting process. We need to be refined, pruned, purged. We need it so that we can walk closer with him. Whatever you're dealing with today, wherever you find yourself at today, be honest. There are some things in your life that the Lord needs to remove. You can just simply say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I surrender. But it doesn't always, it, 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 just simply surrendering is not always what happens. Because what do we say? We don't want to let go. Give up, as an old song we used to say, give up and let Jesus take over. Give up. If you're in the process of sifting right now, if you're going through it, know that God is there. God is there and he has a purpose. And his purpose is that you come forth as gold. Let's pray. Lord, we bless your name today. We thank you once again. We thank you for your word. Lord, we know that this sifting process is, is can be a harrowing process depending on what we're going through. Lord, there, there'll be emotional upheaval, spiritual upheaval, mental upheaval, uh, Lord, upheaval of every kind. Lord, that we know there'll be challenges. Lord, we know that there'll be adversaries at some times. But Lord, we know that you will be with us. Lord, you will never leave us nor forsake us nor will you allow us to be tempted above what we can handle. Lord, we place our lives, we place our every situation, our every circumstance, we place it in your hands. No, we don't understand. No, we don't understand at all. And you have not called us out to understand everything. You've only called us out to trust you. So Lord, help us that we might trust you in our times of testing. Lord, help us to remain humble, Lord Jesus. Help us to remain grateful to who you are. Lord, have your way in our lives. And even as we go through some things in our hearts and in our lives, Lord, we know that you are there. Lord, have your way. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. God is so good. Amen. God bless you, Francis. Once again, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, God bless you, Robillard. God bless you, Sherry and, and Debbie. God bless you. God bless you so much. Amen. And God bless all of those who 
uh, who are watching. Uh, God bless all of those who are uh, watching uh, and listening uh, on Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. Uh, God bless you in the Philippines, Australia, Nigeria, Japan, France. God bless you. God bless you from across the United States and around the world. We thank you for your support and we thank you for downloading our podcast. Amen. If you are watching right now over Facebook and YouTube, if you're watching over Facebook, you can share this page uh, that others also may be blessed. And you can also, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, just let someone know. Invite someone uh, to watch with us uh, on Sunday mornings, even if it's not live. Uh, Invite them to watch uh, at a later time. Amen. We just bless Lord and thank him for what he is doing. Amen. Now, tomorrow night, Uh, Tomorrow night, we are going to continue uh, in our study in the book of Matthew. We've begun chapter number one. We got through the first 16 verses. That is the genealogy. We're going to continue in chapter number one tomorrow night. That's starting at 7 o'clock p.m. This is going to be a life of Christ uh, through the book of Matthew. We're going to be in the book of Matthew for the next several months into the deep into the winter will be into uh yet the book of matthew amen uh the life of christ uh we're ready and and we're very excited about this particular study amen tuesday night we've just begun a brand new series entitled the scent the scent of water amen and we just bless the lord and we thank him uh for what uh, he is doing uh in this particular study, we're talking about portraits of hope and grace. Amen. And on Tuesday night, uh, we'll be talking uh, about another significant uh, Bible character uh, who seemed to be gone, but found hope. Amen. And we pray you would join us on Tuesday night at our new time. Remember, our new time is 8 o'clock on Tuesday night. Amen. Also, don't forget to join us on Wednesday night, First Principles of the Christian Life, Basic Discipleship for the Growing Believer. We've just begun a brand new topic, uh, and that topic is the role of the cross in the Christian life. The role of the cross in the Christian life. And we will continue uh, on that subject uh, beginning Wednesday night at, remember, at 8 o'clock. Amen. So we just bless the Lord and thank him uh, for all that he is doing in this ministry. We just bless him and we thank him for all that he is doing. Now, uh, you can also find uh, my writings uh, on Bible Study Tools and Crosswalk.com. If you'd like to read uh, some very inspirational readings on a variety of subjects. Also at our website, uh, you can go to our blog where we have also extensive reading on various uh, topics. Uh, We pray that, once again, that you will be blessed, enlightened, empowered, and encouraged by all of these things. One more thing that we believe that will bless you is our ebook entitled Remaining Unmovable, Seven Keys to Quality, Longevity in Christ. It is a free download, once again, available on our website, on our resource page. Also, you can go go there and follow our link. Uh, to our book, which we have written, entitled uh, The Lights in the Window, A Basic and Powerful Principles on Evangelism. Is it, a quick, it is a quick read, amen, uh, and I believe that it will, once again, uh, enrich your life, amen, on the topic of evangelism. It is available on Amazon.com, amen. So that's about it. Once again, God bless you, and I want to thank you uh, once again for joining us. Once again, don't forget to share. Uh, Don't forget to tell someone about uh, That's the Word Ministries. We're here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, amen. Four days out of the week, we are here live by God's grace, amen. And so we just pray uh, that you will help us to spread the word of Jesus Christ, amen. Until tomorrow night, hopefully you can join us there at the Monday Night Bible Study. We will see you then at 7 o'clock. May God bless you.